Hi, I'm Laura Cox Kaplan. Welcome to She Said, She Said. Today, we're continuing our series on small business, women who are leading their companies through this very chaotic and really scary time of COVID-19. My guest today is Allison Shapira. Allison is the CEO of a company called Global Public Speaking. She's the author of a book called Speak With Impact, and she's a professor at Harvard's Kennedy School of Government, where she teaches presentation and public speaking. Today, she's gonna to join us to talk about how her business is evolving in the COVID-19 environment, and also to share her tips for making our virtual presentations as impactful and compelling as possible. No matter what seat you're sitting in these days, whether you're leading an organization, working for one, or just communicating with your friends and family, Allison's gonna share some great tips for making sure that those communications are as impactful as possible, but also help you connect with your audience a little bit better. She's also gonna share some perspective from a great article that she recently wrote and published in Harvard Business Review on how to deliver difficult messages to your team uh, via a virtual uh, platform. So all of this will be incredibly timely. Allison, welcome to She Said, She Said. Thank you, Laura, it's great to be back. Well, I'm delighted to have you and back is right. You were my guest on episode 23 back in 2018. And so much has happened obviously during that period of time. In and every way. What we're, yeah, what we're dealing with right now, but you also wrote a terrific book that we did not talk about because it wasn't out yet. Um, so let's start off with though, you are a small business owner. You're the founder of your company, Global Public Speaking. Talk to me about how you're evolving the business in this current environment and what's going on. We are working furious, furiously during this new environment. The company teaches leadership communication. So as people move up in their career, how do their communication skills need to change so that they can become more effective leaders, going from individual contributors to middle managers to senior leaders. And that could be public speaking coaching. It could be training. It's all sorts of focuses on how do you communicate with impact in meetings, pitches, and presentations. We work with Fortune 500 companies, nonprofits, individuals all around the world. So as you can imagine, most of what we do has been in person. Yeah. And we love teaching in person. That's my preference. My whole team loves teaching in person. Well, everything in person has been postponed. Yeah. So as a small business owner, what do you do when all of your confirmed income for the rest of the year is pushed off? That's been a challenge. Some of it has transitioned to virtual and companies are still becoming comfortable, getting comfortable with making that transition. Luckily, we've been teaching virtual trainings for over 10 years. So we've done a quick pivot in our marketing material to transition all of our programs to virtual. And luckily I teach, as you mentioned, at the Harvard Kennedy School. So I was thrown into adapting a six week in-person graduate course on public speaking to a virtual format and taking a one day public speaking course and adapting it to virtual. So I've been, I've been thrown into this process and actually while people have always seen virtual training as, a, as an inferior alternative to in person, what I'm finding is that it's really impactful, just as energizing, people are learning and creating a safe space. And so I'm now feeling even more energized than before about the potential for virtual training for people to invest in their team's professional development and make this shift from in-person communication and engagement with clients and colleagues to virtual and still be able to build trust, to win business, to create community and connection. So it's actually made me even more hopeful about our company and our ability to weather this and the value that we're able to provide companies and individuals as they struggle with making the shift. Yeah. What are you hearing from your clients in terms of their own potential internal timetables about when they might get to the point of hosting in-person events again? I just heard 
from someone a couple of days ago, a very big company that does a ton of in-person events, but they've pushed everything off until June of 2021. Wow. So you hearing from your clients, and it may be too soon to even ask this question, but I'm curious as to what people are saying. Well, it's, it's too soon to know the definitive answer to this question, um, but what we're seeing is that through the end of May, people have definitively pushed things back to later in the summer or the fall. A lot of programs are being moved to the fall, which feels to them like a safe alternative. But the, the real issue is that nobody knows the path that this virus will take and that our country and the world will take. So it's always evolving, which is why we've been pushing so hard for people to immediately start to think about virtual alternatives because a lot of companies don't wanna wait till the fall to invest in their teams, especially when now their teams are being called on to reassure their clients and colleagues through uncertainty. And we want people to immediately start helping their colleagues through that and if you want to help people immediately, you've got to do virtual training. Sure, sure. Before we get into some specific tips, because I really want you to help provide us with some free coaching today, if you don't mind. But of course. Before we get into that, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about some of the creative things that you guys are embarking on and that you see clients embarking on that could be shared with this audience. We're all adapting to this new environment and finding ways to bring our creativity to this. So the first thing that my team and I have done is realizing how many people are hurting financially and physically, whether it's anxiety, whether it's struggling with sickness, we're creating free resources that people can use so that they can go ahead and learn these skills instead of keeping them behind a, a paid wall. Mm -hmm. So we've created a, a web page with ideas, videos, we're getting creative in recording our own videos. And so first of all, thinking not how do I make money from this, but how can I help people through this is bringing out some creativity in us and our product offerings and in the services that we provide. So I'll give you a link that you can post. It's a bit.ly link. So it's an easy one to use. It's bit.ly slash free virtual resources. And I'll send that to you. Okay. That's great. That's great. All right. So let's jump into, let's say your top three to five things that you think people oftentimes miss or that are so basic and so easy that if you did them, it really tweaks your performance and the way that you come across to your audience when you're presenting in one of these virtual platforms. The most important tip that I also see as the one people struggle with the most is where to look oh, when gosh. speaking on camera. And <laughs> you know this from your extensive experience in communication, we've got to look directly into the lens. So right now, I see your image below the lens and I see my e image even further below the lens. And my instinct, many of our instincts, is going to be to look at ourselves when presenting. So when I'm looking at myself right now, you see me looking down. If I look at you, you still may see me looking down. So my challenge is to look directly at a camera lens the entire time. And many of us are doing pitches, we're interviewing for jobs, we're asking for money, we're asking for business, and we can't do it this way because we're breaking that connection. At the same time, when you're speaking or when I'm speaking, I want to be able to see your reaction. So I need to look down, but then I have to look back up. And maybe I want to make sure that my background is okay, even though I should have checked that out beforehand. And, but I'll always come back to the camera lens. And that's what I'm looking into. This is not natural unless you're an on-air reporter and you're used to speaking into a camera. So what we're doing in our virtual trainings is we're forcing people to give presentations in those virtual trainings by looking directly into the camera lens the entire time. And that is the most important tip. That is the hardest for people to practice and learn. But they can learn it because 
Well, because we have no choice, we have to learn it because what we say is critical and our interactions with others right now are critical. So it's our responsibility to use these tools and embrace these tools so that we can continue our mission in the most effective way possible. Absolutely. Okay. Give me a couple more. That's a fantastic one. And I, it is so incredibly hard. Um, Give me a couple more. Okay, couple more include talking through disruptions. So a lot of us, I, and you, you may not relate to this, but a lot of us feel like we're perfectionists and everything we do has to be perfect. I, I know nothing, nobody- Nothing about that, Allison. Nothing nobody can relate to that ever. So the idea is even in person, something's gonna go wrong. Virtually, it's always gonna go wrong. We know this. And so what I found really important is to talk through those disruptions as opposed to freeze and try to figure it out with, um, uh, um, where is that button? Um, it, what I do is I talk through the disruptions. I'll say, okay, now we're gonna do a virtual breakout group and I'm gonna put you into these groups. Give me one minute okay, I'm going over to the virtual breakout group button. I'm going to turn that on. Isn't this interesting? I don't seem to have that functionality. Hey, Laura, could you make me the co-host so that I can go ahead? Thank you so much. Bear with us, everyone. And what I'm doing is I'm talking through the disruption in a calm, pleasant way so that my audience doesn't freak out. Because if I freak out, my audience will freak out. So that's another element of what to keep in mind. And then the third quick tip I'll give you is to raise your laptop so that it's at eye level. Because a lot of people, I'm seeing a lot of people hunched over, maybe they're sitting on a, on a couch and their laptop is over and they're, they're presenting like this. And that's physically destructive, unhealthy. And it also doesn't create a, a strong, warm, confident posture. So I've got a tripod with a laptop tray on it, and my laptop is raised up to eye level. And so I can stand up, I can move around when I'm teaching, I bring in, like I've got a whiteboard I bring in and I write on it. So there's very, it's active and moving and my energy is gonna come through over the camera. But it'll happen only if I'm standing up, standing tall, breathing and looking right into the camera. So those are a few tips that I would add be human, everyone's going through this together, check in on people's families, introduce your pets. One of my clients is saying every video chat, he's asking his colleagues to introduce their pets and families. And that's gonna help us all bond and feel a sense of we're all in this together. Yeah, absolutely. How about for the person who has nervous jitters with public speaking to begin with? What about, for, what, what about advice for that person? I've always recommended breathing as a way to reduce those jitters. We all get nervous and you'll find, and I'm sure you've already found, you can be nervous on camera just as you can be nervous in person. So so doing some deep breathing. In my book, I have techniques for figuring out what's causing you nervousness. Now here's how to address it according to what's causing you that nervousness. There's a great book that I read called Psyched Up by Daniel McGinn, and it's about the science of mental preparation to help you succeed. And in that book, he talks about how hard it is to go from nervous to calm, because that delta is so big. But the delta between nervous and excited is very close because they're both caused by adrenaline. So if you can reframe those nerves as excitement, then use that energy to give you the warmth and energy you need over the camera. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, that's awesome. That's so awesome. Okay, another topic, Allison, that I want you to talk about was the subject of a Harvard Business Review article that you wrote recently about delivering very difficult news via a virtual medium. Everyone, to to one degree or another, is having to engage in these kinds of conversations, conversations that you would never have virtually. You would always have them in person if you could. Obviously, that's not possible right now. So share with us a little bit in terms of how to deliver those conversations as impactfully as, and empathetically as you can, and what suggestions do you have for really making, making that work? 
Sure. That was such a helpful article to write and the research involved was very helpful for me. And now we have a, a new module that we're working with clients on, which is how do you communicate through uncertainty? And we led that virtual training last week for the frontline managers of a U.S. airline. So it was so interesting to be able to apply those techniques to managers who are helping flight attendants and gate crew manage the, the anxiety of walking through empty terminals. Mm -hmm. And so it was really, it, it, it was very helpful to be able to see how that can help others. And in the, the components of communicating through uncertainty are about how do you first and foremost calm yourself so that you can transmit calm to others. A lot of times we're bombarded with information. And so our tendency is just to hit, you know, forward, see below and overload people with complex emails and information that we ourselves don't understand. And we're too busy and too stressed to read through it. Well, if we don't calm ourselves down, how can we calm others down? So I, I walk people through the process of self-regulating their own emotions and then using it productively to communicate with empathy, but also with clarity to your employees or your colleagues. And we talk about using video whenever possible because video is more impactful than email communication. But the more people you have on video, the, the more that dilutes it. So how do you have one-on-one -on -one video conversations, small group video conversations, and then certainly make them larger. But the idea of taking complexity and breaking it down so that it's clear and concise, delivered with empathy and authenticity in your own language is going to reassure people much more than just hitting forward on the company talking points, which could be written in jargon and don't make people feel like we're all in this together. Right, absolutely. That is so incredibly helpful. Allison, talk a little bit about how you personally are managing your own stress and how you're helping your team to manage their stress as well at a time in which there is so much uncertainty and so much disruption. It is a time to be creative for sure. Right. It's right. also really scary. So talk about how what you're doing. So I've I'm trying to apply all those elements I'm teaching others to myself <laughs> and my interactions with my team. I have two brand new full-time employees who just started within the past few months. So we were just getting to know each other and our and our personalities and and work processes in person before I made the decision to have everyone work remotely. So now we're all, we're all working remotely. We do video check-ins multiple times every day. Every meeting that we have is video. I found that really helpful for us to continue working together and put that personal element on it. That doesn't work for everyone. I have a friend who doesn't like her job and doesn't like her colleagues and lives in a small apartment. And so every time her manager insists on video, she feels like it's intrusive, like it's invading her personal space. So it really depends on your relationship with your teams and how you feel about your job. Yeah. Um, personally, I am going for runs as often as I can, getting outside and going for walks. I'm very close with my family. So every morning I FaceTime my parents and we have coffee. And then when I go for a walk, I give my dad a 10 minute warning and then he'll go for a walk and use that time to get in his steps. And we'll talk through a business challenge. He was a small business owner, so he's always been a mentor or simply something that we're doing that day. So I also have a wall of names, sticky notes with people I love and care about, friends, family. And I look at that wall every day and I think, who can I check in with? Who needs a video chat? Who needs a call? And so I have a lot of people on that wall and sometimes someone will call me and I'll think, wow, I must be on their wall too. And that's how I'm using this time personally to stay sane and healthy and, and it, that's going to have an impact on my professional life. And I think that's important for all of us. When we take care of ourselves personally, it will have an impact on our professional relationships. And when we're the boss, we have an obligation to take care of our personal selves because our energy will impact the energy of our teams too. 
absolutely. Oh, Allison, that's such great advice. That's really terrific perspective. I loved having you today, and I'm so grateful that you were willing to share some of these excellent tips with us. And I'll encourage our audience to go back to episode 23, where Allison and I talked a bit more about her story. She's a reformed opera singer turned <laughs> folk singer, and she plays for me in episode 23, for us, actually. Um, and it's fantastic. So, Allison, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My pleasure, Laura. So great to be with you. Thank you for everything that you're doing to get the word out and to use your voice and your platform to be a resource for others. I really admire that. To learn more about our guest, Allison Shapira, please be sure to check out the show notes for this episode, episode 96. I'll include links to Allison's terrific book, as well as to the materials that she talked about during our conversation. As always, friends, thanks so much for listening and or watching. If you're watching us on YouTube, thank you for that as well. And most importantly, for being part of this growing She Said, She Said community. And if you haven't already, please be sure to go to the website and sign up for the Friday newsletter. I include links to our past episodes, as well as some great complimentary materials, books that we love, things that have made us smile over the course of the last week, or articles that are really making us think. Most importantly, thanks for being part of all of this. Thanks for your friendship and your continued support. Be safe and be well.